Welcome to why we should be optimistic about nature's future. This is the first day of our Earth Optimism Stories of Hope. And today's theme is reasons for optimism. And I'm sure all of you who took part would agree that the conservation success stories we heard about today really can give us reasons for hope. And today was just a snapshot. Earth optimism is actually a word worldwide movement. So as well as Cambridge, uh, there are events in Nairobi, which had a fantastic launch today. Um, the Smithsonian Institute's Earth Optimism started a few days ago. And soon you can travel digitally to Rio de Janeiro and Sydney. And we're all part of the Earth Optimism Alliance. And we share the same aim of shifting how we talk about the environment from stories of doom and gloom to solutions and stories that celebrate conservation success. And I'm sure you'd all agree that if all we hear is bad news, it leads us to think there's nothing we can do and we can do something. And that's why we're here tonight. And I can't think of a better person than Chris Packham to be joining us this evening in our first Stories of Hope live questions and answers session. Chris is one of our most passionate and inspiring enthusiasts for our natural world. And he's brought that to us through our screens and th through his writing um, and really just telling us um, why, why nature inspires him. But Chris isn't just someone who talks about why we should conserve nature. He takes action too. Chris, we have over a thousand people joining us this evening to ask you questions and hear what you have to say. So welcome to this session on why we should be optimistic. Uh, thank you, Rosie. Thank you for the invitation to partake in this. I, I, I think that it's really important that we keep a perspective on optimism and hope. I think equally that we mustn't be afraid of, of the bad news. We just must use that to fuel our desire to generate more good news. And, and it's heartening that you've been exploring so much of that good news. And there's plenty out there, not just here in the UK, where it's close to home and sometimes easier for us to observe, but um, all over the world. It occurs in the field. It, it occurs in, 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 in the lab. It occurs on people's computers. There are a lot of imaginative ingenuity, you know, people with enormous amounts of ingenuity um, and energy out there. And they're hell bent on making a difference before we go to hell in a handcart. So there's plenty of reason, I think, to, to sometimes stop and reflect upon the fact that, you know, we have the capacity to restore, to repair, to rebuild, to reintroduce, whatever it happens to be. Um, and that's down to a, 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 you know, a testament of a, and a legacy of an enormous amount of hard work, mainly done by scientists and, and conservationists occasionally naturalists have thrown their ore into the water too, and, and pioneered some great schemes which have been proved to work. So I'm very pleased to be able to join you and, and share a little of that optimism and, and hopefully put some perspective on some of the pessimism. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, you, you told us this morning how important um, it is for you to connect to the natural world. And I, I love, love that woodland that you were sitting in and um, talking, us, talking to us from. Um, uh, so we have a question from Sam Hirons who says, do you think the pandemic has had a positive impact on the way people perceive nature? And can this tra translate to improved conservation outcomes in the future? I think it has. Um, my mother always used to say, you've got to find some good in the bad. And there's no doubt at all that the last 12, 18 months have been pretty bad parts of it. Uh, people have had the, the most challenging periods of their of their lives in some instances. People have lost their their lives and their businesses are in trouble. They're, they're in trouble. Mental health has, has been a, a real issue. But we've got to, to, to see something in all of that fear, all of that frustration, all of that chaos, um, something positive. And one thing that's come out of it is people's reconnection with nature. And it continues now. Um, there was a surge of it. Um, I think it surprised some people when the first lockdown started a, just over a year ago. Um, and they took to their gardens, they took to their green spaces, um, but they did it in a different way. Rather than seeing things, they looked at them. Rather than hearing things, they listened to them. Just that little bit of extra time that they had because they weren't rushing to school or rushing to work meant that they you know, heard that bird song but they listened and discovered it was a, a blackbird, it was a robin. And the un, 
unparalleled unparallel joy that people expressed when they were connecting with commonplace animals and plants, um, you know, for us as naturalists um, in their community was was fantastic absolutely fantastic bird food was selling out more rapidly than ever before people were digging ponds in their garden their children were doing you know their their homeschooling outside and 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 that and was being integrated into their schooling i just think that we mustn't forget what nature gave to us at that time of crisis continues to to give to us um, and we must remember that if we not in an exploitative way but if we took a little something from it then we should be prepared to put a little something back um, and and as a consequence of that i'm hoping that you know the affinity that was engendered at that time by an enormous number of people has been sufficiently powerful to, to bring them on board and, and, and sow seeds of a desire to conserve the world and look after their communities. Because let's, you know, let's start off with, well, I'll try not to get, to get too statistical, but you know, we are one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet. It's always easy to say, but hard to believe. You know, when you think about the number of NGOs, um, the number of bodies, community groups, a number of individuals that go out there and work hard for wildlife. It, it's hard to imagine that this tiny part of the world, uh, which is so well known and where its wildlife is so well loved, is one of the most nature depleted. But that's the facts of it. I mean, you know, that there's no ambiguity about that. So yeah. our backyard is not in its best shape. And that's down to us. And that means that we've got a challenge on our hands to, to rectify that as quickly as possible. Great, thank you. I love the fact you mentioned um, things like digging ponds because so on, on the Earth Optimism Solutions Fair, there are a whole load of tips that um, people can follow for that kind of thing. The other thing I noticed that um, you said just now and in the piece you told us this morning, you, you know, when you mentioned nature, you mentioned things like robins and the celandines and the primroses. Uh, you mentioned uh, our sort of what, perhaps people often would see as more common species. And, um, and I, I think that's wonderful that we should celebrate all nature. And we've got a question here from Stephen Alain, who says, how can we get people more enthused about the less charismatic and sexy species, such as amphibians and insects? Well, that's a difficult one for me to answer because I don't see them as any less charismatic, <laughs> I'm afraid. I mean, I tend to refute celebrity. I'm suspicious of celebrity. Uh, we see it in so many aspects of our lives, everything from sport through to music and movies and, and, and everything else. And I'm afraid it's infiltrated into wildlife too. And people are um, unfortunately encouraged to have a preoccupation with you know, the, the big celebrity species, the megafauna, if you like, the t-shirt animals, as I call them, you know, it, it, it's lions, it's leopards, it's polar bears, it, it's dolphins, it's whales. But for me, all, these things are beautiful and very often fascinating, but they're also quite inaccessible. Um, you know, if I go on my walk tomorrow, I will not encounter a lion, a tiger, a polar bear, a dolphin or a whale, but I will encounter, if I'm fortunate, a, a robin, um, some celandines and primroses. And, and so the first thing to say is that for, for me, it, it, that connectivity is important, you know, uh, being able to kneel down and smell them and feel them and, and for them being able to enhance the quality of my life because of their presence in my community is, is scoring you know, a lot of points. They're already edging ahead of, of, of leopard and so forth. But then when I delve into the ecology, the behavior, the physiology, whatever it happens to be of these animals, I find fascinating things, you know, things which are equally as interesting as the fascinating things about the, uh, about the leopards. So I think that, um, of course, it's difficult to push back against something that snarls with spots um, and is, you know, frequently lauded as one of nature's greatest masterpieces. But, for, you know, I always say I'd, I'd rather spend 10 minutes with a woodlouse on the palm of my hand than 10 minutes watching a tiger on TV. 
because I can feel the woodlouse, you know, and it tickles me with its little feet. And it's a fascinating crustacean. There's over 45 species in the UK. They're the only crustaceans that don't have to return to water to breed. They only mate in total darkness. And the males use their antennae and they tap the carapace of the female in a most gentle way. And we've only seen this in recent years, given advances in camera technology. So wood lice have it, you know, and, and if I can feel that woodlouse, then my connection to it overcomes every, everything else. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to, we need to build a sense of, of community. So people you know, do feel a greater attachment to those species, which they you know, are living amongst. You know, of course we can fantasize about leopards, but I'm rather pleased that they're not prowling around the wood where I'll be walking tomorrow morning because they probably predate my two poodles and I wouldn't be too happy about that. That's great. We're going to have a lot of people rushing out tomorrow to look for wood lice. So good luck. And it's going to be a lovely day. Um, uh, so uh, that's one of my, uh, you mentioned sort of connecting with, with nature and so on. We had a lot of questions from people asking about how children can become more involved and um, quite a few from teachers actually. So for, we've got um, Paul Gabb, Pete Ruddy and Erica Webster all asked the same thing. Paul Gabb is a primary school teacher and he said, what are the key messages you would say to children? And, and they're basically asking um, that. And do you think schools should be doing more to teach children about nature? I think schools are our best opportunity. Um, I'm fortunate enough pre-COVID, hopefully post-COVID, as much as we'll be post-COVID. Um, in safer times, I look forward to meeting young people. And sometimes on Saturday mornings, I meet them in car parks and they are brought there by their parents. And I, I, you know, I won't mince my words. Most of the parents are white and middle class and they arrive in Volvos and Audis. Um, it's a very particular set of children that I get to meet. Some of them are really gifted naturalists. Um, others are, are, are certainly benefiting from their time outside and we're thankful for their parents' energies to bring them along. But I, I wanna to talk to everyone. You know, I, I, I want to make sure that the message gets through to every community. Now, at this point in time, um, with a few exceptions, everyone has to go to school. So that is a trusted, safe environment where parents allow their children to go to be educated and for their lives to be hopefully enhanced. So I think schools represent our best opportunity of getting that message to everyone, not just the white middle class kids that have just climbed out of a, a new Volvo. Um, and therefore, trying to integrate you know, natural history um, into schools is really important. But I think I think the key thing for me is that, I mean, is the touching, it's that connecting. Young people are essentially, you know, biophilic. They like life, they're curious about life. They see an animal, they wanna stroke it. They wanna know what it feels like. You know, some of us used to eat tadpoles because we wanted to know what they tasted like. You know, that curiosity is unconfined, but we've got to let young people exercise that curiosity. We mustn't, tell them or infer that, you know, that, that touching a woodlouse or a worm or a slug or a snail or anything else they might encounter is, is dirty. It's not dirty, it's sticky. That doesn't mean it's dirty. Um, and, and when I see, you know, the, the, you know the, the enormous amounts of hand gel being squirted around when young people have touched a newt or a tadpole, my heart sinks, but that's sending out entirely the wrong message. For me, the tickle of a tadpole on the palm of a hand is a way of igniting a spark that could burn for a lifetime, a spark of interest and a passion and a, of love for wildlife. It's tadpoles, to the best of my knowledge, are, are not toxic and therefore they don't need hand gel after you've handled them. And when I see young people being taken out onto nature reserves and they're all wearing high-vis jackets, my heart sinks. We associate high-vis with dangerous environments roadsides, building sites, whatever. But the, the woodland isn't a dangerous environment. Um, and, you know, it, these subliminal subconscious messages which we're giving young people are counterproductive. What we should be doing, I think, is with proper monitoring and with sensible safety concerns, we should be allowing them to explore that environment for themselves, as some of us were lucky enough to do. And that means they get stung by stinging nettles, they get scratched by brambles, they get stung by wasps, they might get bitten by a mouse if they take it out of a, 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 out of a trap. 
you know, and, and, and these things are all part of a formative process of engagement. And for me, that is absolutely essential. It's so hard to learn a love for life in a library. It's so much easier to, to grow that love, you know, firsthand through that firsthand connection. So I think it's really important that we put young people back in contact with nature and we allow them their space and time to explore it. We might monitor it from a safe distance, but we allow them to, to feel it, smell it, touch it. That, that's for me is really important. That's fabulous. Thanks, Chris. I was thinking um, we have so many questions and they're all coming in through the um, live Q&A. Please do um, keep them coming. So perhaps moving to another, sort of the other end of the extreme, I guess, there's a lot of political questions here, really about what, um, what, what we can persuade the government to do, what the government can do. So for example, um, Karen, has, who's out in the audience tonight, has asked, how can we encourage the UK government to recognize how vital it is um, both to conserve nature and build nature connection um, into the national curriculum? So it's really about how the government, how, how can the government do more to conserve nature as well as perhaps linked to the national curriculum as well. Okay, I'll, I'll answer it back to front. So the national curriculum, um, I, I mean, I'm of an opinion without going into too much detail, and I'm sure it will be an opinion shared by many viewers this evening that our education system is not as optimal um, and serving our young people as maximally as it possibly could. Um, I think it is in need of, of, of broad reform. And when, when we see education systems in other parts of the world, which offer young people far greater opportunities um, and, and they are far more rewarding to them in terms of their mental, physical health and their learning, um, then it's clear that we, we, we need to take a, a look at that. Um, at the moment, Mary Colwell, who is um, an author and conservationist um, is proposing that we have a GCSE in natural history. Um, and I think it's a good idea. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the syllabus will be, but I think that symbolically, that's a great idea. It means that there is sufficient to learn to be tested there and that with such a qualification, it would show um, a, a focused fascination at a particular age, which might lead to you know, involvement with other sciences and so on and so forth. So I think that that's an interesting thing and I'm, I'm clearly support, supporting that. Our politicians, well, I think we live in exceptional times, but we have unfortunately, globally, pretty much, um, elected um, unexceptional, an unexceptional crop of leaders. But in the UK, we live in what purports to be a, a democracy. We have voted for these people. They are our elected representatives. They are there, therefore, to represent us, not themselves, but us. And I think that one thing we have to do is democratically and peacefully um, sometimes remind them of, of that fact. And if we have grave concerns about any aspect, um, aspects in our lives, then we have the right to remind them of that. And, and that's why I have some concerns about this new bill that's going through about protest because I think protests can be really important historically. Um, if you think back even just the last hundred years, back into the last century, um, how important you know, protests were in terms of civil rights in America, in, in terms of dealing with issues of race and gender, without those protests bringing concerns to a wider public uh, arena, generating a wider public awareness, then we wouldn't have made the progress that we've needed to make. And I think protests should continue to play a role, um, so long as they're peaceful, uh, of, of course. Um, so I, I think it's it's down to us. I think typically, you know, certainly when it comes to, I mean, let's just step sideways for a moment, when it comes to sport, um, you know, we are a nation of moaners. We moan about our cricket team, our rugby team, our football team. I, I do no moaning. I've completely given up sport and any interest in it. But, but that's typically what we do. We sit in pubs and we moan about it. We don't do anything about it. We have to become a nation of doers. And that's why I was particularly inspired by, you know, Extinction Rebellion in, in the spring of 2019. And particularly, even more so, all of the youth climate protests that took place. These were young people who were demanding to exercise their voice so that they could ask again democratically for change. So I think that, you know, if our 
elected representatives aren't representing us, we must ensure that they do. And we have the ability to do that every four or five years or, or whatever by putting a cross in a box. And if that doesn't work in the interim period, we have to remind them. And we can do that by writing to them. We can sign petitions. There are plenty of ways that we can signal to these people that we, the populace, are unhappy. And at the moment, I think there are a lot of reasons to be unhappy when it comes to the way that they are neglecting to care for the environment and the climate and everything else. And that's why we protest. That's why I've taken legal challenges against HS2 and why we continue to you know, campaign and petition against some of these what we perceive as um, irresponsible actions when it comes to, to climate. Um, can, I, can, I, can I just stop you there? Because I've just, just got a question in about HS2, actually. Uh, Tom Baus um, has asked, uh, he's, I'm Tom and I'm 12. Uh, I can't believe that HS2 is really going ahead. What do you think we should be doing to help stop this now? Or is it too late? And if it is, how can we minimise the impact it will have on animals and the environment. And I must say, several people have actually asked about HS2. Um, Jenny Langley is one of them. So could you ask, answer Tom's question? Yeah, please? of course, Tom, thank you for your question. Um, HS2 is, um, is a, 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 what, what I might call a vanity project. It's also enormously expensive. At the moment, the you know, supposition is that it might cost more than 110 billion pounds. We've spent between 20 and 25 billion pounds already. That's an enormous sum of taxpayers' money, money that's come out of your parents' pocket and, and mine and all of the other adults watching this. Watching this. Um, but look, you know, 20 billion pounds is a lot of money, but it's, it's a lot less than 120. There is still time economically to pull the plug on this and say we've made a mistake, but that requires courage. It requires bravery. It's hard for humans to put their hands up and say, I got it wrong. But here is an instance where I believe that we, we, we did get it wrong um, and we've had plenty of opportunities to, to start getting it right, but we're not taking them. And I, I think that the ongoing, I mean, and it was ongoing all the way through the lockdowns and our COVID year, the ongoing you know, energy and money and effort being put into HS2 is in, entirely misplaced. And symbolically so too, because you know, it is a project which won't be carbon neutral until well into the next century. And that's, that's from HS2's figures. That's not from, from my data. Um, it, it is a project which is plowing through 108 ancient woodlands, you know, in a country where we've got only 13% tree cover, and that's less than any other country in Western Europe. We are one of the most deforested countries in the world, and yet we're still cutting down this, this precious habitat. And all of this in the face of the fact that we will be hosting the COP at the end of the year, if COVID allows, I presume, in, 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 in Glasgow. Um, and how embarrassing is that going to be when we've got this monstrous project in, in our own backyard, um, damaging the environment, damaging biodiversity, creating divisions between um, communities, damaging people's livelihoods, their mental health and their businesses. Um, and it's all built on, a, on an outdated premise. It, when it's completed, the, it, it would be outdated technology if it's com completed. So anyway, in, in, into what that's, so that's all the bad news, but this is, remember, we're talking about optimism here. Um, we, we have the, the capacity to say we don't want it. I tried to say that, in, I did say that in court, and I, I took the government to court, and I was supported by, generously, by many members of the public who helped fund that case. Um, we have the, 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 you know, the capability of peacefully protesting when it's safe to do so. Um, and, and, and we should do that. We have the capacity to pick up our pens or, or poise our fingers on our keypads and communicate to our MPs and constantly communicate to our MPs that this is a, a bad idea and, and we don't want any more of it. And then lastly, we have the imagination to generate um, a wider, again, public awareness of the problems with this project. And, and sometimes that's not about shouting, that's about writing music, writing poetry, doing art. It's about being clever. And, and sometimes we have to exercise our, our, you know, our imagination so that we can get newspaper space, we can get airtime, because we need to change just 25% of people's minds to completely change any issue. 
You know, once you get 25% of a population, you know, agreeing that black is black and white is white, then that becomes the accepted norm. Now, I don't know where we stand with HS2 at the moment. I don't know what percentage of the population um, doesn't want it, does want it or doesn't care. But if we got to 25% of people not wanting it, effectively, we'd be able to stop it. And we're only going to do that if we keep telling people why it's, it's not a good thing at this point in time. And that's what we must do. So what I suggest you do is find a way of peacefully and in an interesting way, representing your you know, mistrust or dislike of this project um, and then publishing it as widely as you can. And I'm sure that there will be many things you could do. You could do some drawings some paintings of your favourite animals and maybe they'd be getting cut down by chainsaws or, or something like that. So I think that, that that's what we need to do. And we mustn't stop because winning for me is not giving up. Winning is not stopping HS2 because there'll just be something else. There'll be a coal mine in Cumbria or it'd be another runway at Heathrow. Winning is never, never giving up. It's, it's about keeping going. And that's unfortunately our Sisyphean lot. We've got to keep pushing that rock up the mountain. And that's going to be my job for the rest of my life. And I think it's got to have to be yours too. That's wonderful, Chris. I think you, you are inspiring all of us to do, to do more. I think that's really important. Um, I, I've got... I want to ask two questions in a row. You don't have to answer the first one, but please answer the second one. The first one is, can you run for prime minister, please? You've got my vote. That was from uh, Ben Hurst. You don't have to answer that one, but um, could you please answer this one from Nicola Power? Um, what progress has been made in implementing some of the policy ideas in your manifesto for nature and how can we support this? Okay, well, strangely enough, this morning I was talking to Brian Cox and we were musing over what we might be able to do to make a more rapid difference in terms of the environment and he not I you know said that maybe people like us ought to start you know running and, and we both agreed that the problem with you know trying to become an elected representative in in the UK is that means that you have to be a member of a political party and I'm not too keen on party politics to be quite honest with you and I I can't find any particular parties that I would wholly support on every issue. So for the time being, I'll, 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 I'll stand outside the room with my placard, uh, politely asking for changes inside the room. But let's, let's see what happens at some point in, in, in the future. The manifesto was a raft of ideas that I got independent experts to put together to that if, if enacted would make an immediate difference. So each of my experts wrote an essay and then came up with 10 things that if we did them today would make a difference tomorrow. Um, we were to do a, I was gonna do a second version of the manifesto. Um, it got delayed firstly because of the double election that we had and then because of Brexit. And the reason for that is I pay for it out of my own pocket. It's quite expensive and I, I want it to count. And, you know, I sent the manifesto to all of the elected representatives across the UK, and even that cost a fortune. Um, so um, I will do another manifesto, a new expanded manifesto, when I know that it's going to get into the right hands, and it's also going to have the right people listening to it. And um, obviously, after Brexit, we've had COVID, so there's still, still time. In terms of the first draft, um, so I think some of those things have been have been heeded. I don't think any of our elected representatives are going to say, I got this idea from Chris Packham and all of his chums manifesto. That's not the way they work. I have no concern for that whatsoever. I, I, I want a result. I, I, you know, I and my colleagues want no glory from that whatsoever. We just want a better world. So we're very happy to have our ideas plagiarised. But there are some quite significant things in the manifesto which haven't been addressed and they give me ongoing concern. And there are a whole load. I'll, I'll mention perhaps one or two. Um, one is that in the UK, we still have no capacity to measure the amount of pesticides that we're using. There is no central pesticide management or, or recording body. So we, we are able to put together some ideas of how much pesticides being pumped into our environment, but not, not with complete accuracy. And then as we've seen this spring, you know, 
the government reneged on its ban of neonicotinoid pesticides, which we know, again, without ambiguity through scientific research, have proved to be enormously damaging. Um, but because of a particular pest, um, blighting a particular crop, they said, oh, well, let's, let's actually renege on the ban um, and, and we'll use them again. Well, that is, that was, that, I mean, thankfully they didn't have to use them. Uh, conditions changed and they weren't used. But had they used them, I think that would have elicited an, an enormous uh, fight. I know that there were people behind the scenes investigating, taking legal action uh, against the government for that. And that would, have, that would certainly uh, you know, have been the case had it gone ahead. Um, we can't do that. You, know, you, can't, you can't invest... In, in great minds to do great work and peer review and publish it and prove that something's toxic. And then after years of, of campaigning and debate and, and consultation, ban it and then unban it again. That, that's an enormous step backwards. So I think that in those sorts of issues, um, you know, we've flagged our concerns, but we're not, they're not, they're not high enough up the public agenda, you know. The, the ills of glyphosate are still out there and it's still being used many, many tons of this carcinogenic, you know, wildlife destroying chemical are being pumped into the UK landscape. And, and the vast majority of people are unaware of that and unaware of the damage that it does. Food labeling is another thing I might mention um, that there's been very little progress. I'm leading another campaign at the moment to improve the lives of um, battery, essentially industrially, industrially farmed chickens in the UK. Biggest problem is, to be frank with you, that when people go shopping, they, they don't know what they're buying. They know it's cheap, so they might be able to imagine that it's had a miserable life. Um, my suggestion, you know, to quite simply overcome this, which is enormously unpopular and perhaps a little impractical, is that um, we should put photographs on the, on the packaging, you know, of, of where those chickens have been living. You know, we used to do that with cigarettes. You know, we used to... Uh, uh, you know, have initially we had cigarette, you know, in their packets, then there was a label on it that said they can seriously damage your health. And then they started putting photographs of, you know, seriously diseased human organs as a result of smoking on there. Well, what about if we just put pictures of where those chickens were living on, 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 on that packaging in the supermarket? so that then people could make a fair and informed choice. Well, I don't think they'd be buying quite so much of those chickens that only have an A4 sized piece of paper of space that gets slaughtered after five or six weeks and can't stand up. So they're rolling around in their own excrement and it's so acidic that it burns all the skin off their chest. I mean, do you want that on a Sunday lunchtime? A lot of people wouldn't. No, so I think, um, yeah. But thank, I'm sorry, thank I, start, I sort of launched into campaigning, but I mean, I think the key thing is that, you know, what the manifesto, they sought to do was to bring these sorts of issues to public attention. Unfortunately, they very quickly fade there. And that's why we need to work harder to, to, to keep those things high up the agenda. Sure, sure. Now, uh, that, that's um, great. So uh, we've, got, we've got so many questions coming in. Um, I mean, so many people have been in, inspired by you, Chris, that we have lots of questions asking, you know, your advice about um, what uh, everybody can do, what everyone can do to help nature and the planet. Um, in fact, we have some some people from uh, from you know, from towns, for example. We've got several people: Oliver Tamayo, Daisy Stafford, Rachel Line. They're all basically saying, um, you know, how can they help wildlife in urban areas? And Oliver Tamayo, age seven, says, "What can I do to help wildlife in my tiny city garden?" Right. Well, cities are actually quite you know productive resources for wildlife. Quite a lot, a lot of species have adapted to live alongside us or can live alongside us quite happily. Um, and in many of our cities in the UK, we're fortunate to have quite a lot of green spaces um, because they the nature of the development of cities. A lot of them were sited on rivers because we didn't have you know, when they were built initially, we didn't have piped water. So we needed water there to drink and to irrigate our crops, to carry our sewage away and so on and so forth. And rivers are a great conduit for life to get into a, a city. We have metropolitan parks in many of our cities, London, Manchester, uh, all, all over the place, and plenty of green spaces if they haven't um, yet been built on. So I think the first thing is to make sure that those, those places are in the best health that they possibly could be. Um, metropolitan parks, well, do they need to be all mown lawn? Or could we have wild flower meadows over some of that area? 
just an idea. Um, last time I was in any of the London parks, I didn't see any nest boxes for birds. Why aren't there nest box schemes in, in there? We put nest boxes up in nature reserves all over the place. Why don't we put them up in our metropolitan parks? There were so many simple things that we could do to enhance the urban environment to make it even more appealing and productive for, for, for wildlife. And even if you have a small space, doesn't mean that you can't cater for small things. Um, so, you know, we encouraged this year, my stepdaughter and I, um, throughout the spring for, for one of the broadcasts that we were doing, for people to put a washing up bowl in their garden as perhaps, a, you know, the smallest pond you can have. Now, it's enormously in, in, inexpensive. Um, you might even just have an old one kicking around. Um, but then we had rafts of people sending us pictures of newts that had turned up in the bowls and frogs that had turned up in the bowls and dragonflies and all sorts of life which had sought out these mini resources deep into the heart of our cities. I think the next thing you need to do is to, is to peer over the fence and start talking to your neighbor because if you build an oasis, it could still be isolated with lots of other unfavorable environment. So you need to start spreading the word. And, and spreading the word like that is, you know, if you have a commonality, say, over cutting holes in the fence to let hedgehogs through, you might find yourself talking to your neighbour about something else which gives you concern in the community. And that conversation is actually a very healthy thing outside of wildlife. And we find that wildlife is, in, in this instance, is actually a very good way of community building, essentially getting people talking to one another. So there's, there's no question of that. But... Don't underestimate that, you know, what you can do. And, and, and in terms of, you know, other urban spaces, um, what about all of our verges? We're very much hoping this year that not so many of them will be mown as early as sometimes they are, because last year when they couldn't be mown due to the lockdown and COVID restrictions, everyone was loving all of the wildflowers. So now's the time to write to your local council, to highways, to the people that govern these these potentially brilliant resources and say to them, look, can you just not cut them until September? I mean, obviously cut them around roundabouts where visibility is an issue and at road junctions, there are places where they need to be cut so that we are safe. But other areas, just leave them. We enjoyed their beauty last year. Wildlife prospered there. It, it, was, it was a healthy environment for, for humans and everything else. So I think even if you're in a city, there's so much you can do to enhance that space, either doing it yourself in your own garden, on your window box, on your balcony, or by, again, getting the pen and the fingers out and communicating with your local representatives and telling them what you want, because that's your democratic right. That's wonderful. Actually, we've got we've got a, a, a lovely um, garden section in our solutions fair that uh, I would encourage people to go and look at. Obviously, not now. And in fact, there is a there is a video about from Dan Danahar who worked with children to turning uh, turning verges into butterfly havens. So that that's great. Um, we've also got a, a note from Chris Gooder Petch who said um, he says this is a fascinating session, and he lives in Berlin. And he says that, um, that the German Nature Protection Agency has put up lots of nest boxes in parks in Berlin. And um, so he, he talks about that. And they've Berlin's even fantastic. I, I've been to Berlin um, uh, only on a couple of occasions um, and, and very briefly. It has urban nightingales. Can you imagine that? And there was a fabulous survey put together to get people to go out and engage with nightingales in the city of Berlin. It has at least, as I recall, you know, 19, 20 pairs of breeding goshawk. They're not persecuted in, in Germany the way that they are here in the UK in some places. So they've spread into their cities. Uh, Berlin's got wild boar standing at bus stops stops. I mean, we're very envious of Berlin's wildlife, I've got to tell you. But that's because of the way the city is managed and the way the people who live in that city have grown to like living alongside wildlife. There's a greater degree of harmony there. And, and, they, and they love it. They all go out and listen to their nightingales. And who wouldn't? The song is exquisite. That's, that's absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, I mean, you, you've, you've been talking quite a lot, I think, about how to communicate and, and engage people, but we have a lot of questions about that from people. So in other words, um, how do you um, communicate and engage with people from all backgrounds? How do you cut through the noise of mixed messages, social media, day-to-day -day living? That's from Ali Burley. Um, so essentially, um, and Isabel Humphrey says, what can the rest of us do um, so you do so much to inspire change from your celebrity platform. Um, Isabel asks, what can the rest of us do to change hearts and minds amongst those who are putting the planet second? Well, yeah, I, 
there's nothing special about me. I, I might just have a few more followers on social media. Um, and, and not all of them follow me for, I don't think, the right reason. But anyway, I think that, you know, we've all got friends, you know, hopefully. We've, we've all got family, hopefully. Um, we've all got people that we, we work with um, and that we know. And it's about constantly spreading that message. And every recruit is, is, an, is, another, is someone else on board. And, and I think that the key ingredient when it comes to communicating is enthusiasm. It, 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 it's passion because, you know, that's what people respond. Why do we, why do we like Sir David Attenborough so much? I, I think we like him because well, of a, a, a multitude of reasons, probably. But the key thing is that whenever he's speaking to us, whenever he's telling us a story, he's doing so with passion that comes direct from his heart. And that's it's immediately transparent when we see him. You know, see him. You know, it's not come from a script that he, someone else has written years ago and it's about a subject he knows nothing and he's just doing it because he wants to buy another bottle of Beaujolais or something, you know. Um, it, it, he's doing it because he'd be doing it whether he was being paid or not, you know. And, and, and that passion is, is a great way of infecting other people and, and, you know, eliciting their enthusiasm, inspiring them. And I think that, you know, that's what we... That's our best tool. And we've got to tell, and when it comes to campaigning, I think that, you know, we live in a difficult age. There's so much mistruth out there now. And, and people have some quite insidious tactics, easy, I mean, dull, in, uh, but insidious and sometimes effective tactics to minimize our credibility, our integrity, our um, desire for positive change. But so what? You know, you can't let that get to you. You've just got to carry on telling the truth, you know, revising that truth if it needs revising. I mean, again, you know, I was talking to Brian this morning and we, we were talking about science and the fact that it really just provides us with temporary facts and science gets more wrong than right. But whilst we think that something's right, that's the story that we use. That's the foundation that we use for our campaigning. We can speak about things emotionally and, and that can be energizing and that can be our fuel, but we need a foundation of facts if we're asking people to change their minds. And so I think that that's always the best, that's the best platform to build upon. So if you're trying to ask someone to change what they do, to make the world a better place you need to provide them with accessible evidence and if you can provide them with that evidence in an enthusiastic and passionate way then they're more likely to be infected by it and to take it on board so i think that you know you know oh what does oscar wilde quote about you know uh, you know killing with a sword and, 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 and with a kiss. If you can, if you can, you're more likely to change the world with a smile on your face than a scowl. That's what it comes down to. That's great, thank, thank you. I think um, we're gonna have a lot more communication going on out there, Chris, because I can assure you so many people have asked that question. And I thought that was such a brilliant answer. So I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more people um, communicating passionately, but as you say, backed up by science. So we've done politics, uh, we've talked quite a lot about schools as well and um, uh, inspiring others. And we've talked uh, about, um, well, obviously why we should be optimistic. We've got, we've got a question here uh, from Tim Cluttenbrock. What is the alternative to a growth economy and how can this be achieved? Well, trust Tim. <laughs> um, Tim is a sort of a distant mentor of mine. I've obviously been reading his work for, for, for many years. Um, it's a very good question. Look at this. This is a, a piece of technology that I have. We've all got them. It's a smartphone. And um, most people in, in the UK, I'm told, upgrade their smartphones every 18 months. Um, I've had this one for about, oh, I don't know, five or six years. So I'm, I'm bucking that trend, I'm pleased to say. Uh, when I bought it, I, I do SIM only, so I, I buy my, my phones. When I bought it, I think it was about £550. It's a lot of money. It's really, really expensive. Um, but what's the environmental cost of that £550? Is that, is that the true cost of this? When you consider that, you know, the, the precious metals in, in here have been mined probably in the most unsavory way with hideous conditions for the workers and for the, you know, uh, the, 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 the supporting community, um, exploited, um, poor safety standards, um, toxic waste leaking into the environment, damaging that. 
Um, it's been put together in, in a factory. Can we be assured that the people that were, were working on this were paid fairly for their work? I, I'm not entirely sure that we can. Uh, so the social and environmental cost of this is far more than 500 pounds. And the key thing is, to answer Tim's question, does this make me happy? Does this, does this phone make me happy? Well, I've got to tell you that occasionally it does because my partner sends me a, a, you know, a happy snap of one of our poodles or something, puts a smile on my face, but mostly this phone doesn't. This is a conduit to angst. You know, people ring me up asking me to do things I don't want to do. Um, you know, I'm constantly aggravated by what I see on this phone. This is not a portal to happiness, you know? A walk in the woods every day makes me happier than this mobile phone. And I think that we have been lured into uh, a, a materialistic world where we, we sense that we must constantly acquire stuff. But I think one thing we can all do, and I've been doing this, you know, I've just moved house and I've, I've, I've had to shed quite a lot of stuff, I've downsized. Um, and I, I started looking at my stuff and I sort of thought, what have I got that for? Do I need that, that stuff? Do we need as much stuff? Because stuff is consumption and consumption is energy use. It's, it's carbon, it's climate, it's, it's the vicious circle. And, and I think that, you know, and it sounds idealistic and it sounds a lot more hippie than punk rock, but if we all took a long, hard look at our lives and actually thought in our lives, what enhances the quality of that life, essentially what makes us content, comfortable, happy, whatever of those that you aspire to, I bet you it's not your massive TV. It's not your, you know, super duper new car which you've upgraded after having one just three years ago that wasn't quite as shiny. I don't know. Um, the things that, make, you know, my poodles make me happier than, than instantaneously and predictably happier than anything else on the planet. All they have to do is run for the sheer joy of running. And I feel my heart fluttering. You know, they make me smile. I just start laughing. And sometimes they make me so happy by just running on a beach that I have to shout, not at them or after them, but because I, there's no other means of, you know, <laughs> containing that joy, which is what I've always called my joy grenades. Now, my poodles were relatively expensive, I suppose. And, but you... But do you see what I'm saying? I think what we need is, a, and what we'll probably be forced to have is a reappraisal of how much stuff we need so that we minimize our consumption. But of course, as Tim has intimated, this goes against the very underlying economic model that we, that we, that we run globally at the moment, essentially capitalism. Um, but, you know, I think- Chris, I, I'm, I've got so many more questions. So okay, I think, well, well I, just to conclude, I, I think there, yeah, are plenty, on, Tim, there are plenty of people working on, you know, in some way or, or other, remodeling capitalism. And it, it isn't the economic revolution that so many um, capitalists feel it might be. Um, it's, it's, it's modifications. And, and I think that, you know, whether we like it or not, we're, we're going we're gonna to be going in that direction. No, th yeah, thanks, thanks. Um... That, that, that's a brilliant answer. So I think we should leave our phones behind and go for a walk in the woods for a start. And, uh, and I know many people whose phones don't make them happy anyway. There is, there's, a, there's a comment here from um, Anna Turns who says, uh, look up Fairphone, responsibly mined and built to be recycled. I've met them, yes, I've, I've met them. And they, they're like a unit phone, which you can constantly update parts of. So if your battery's flat or you want a new camera, which is mildly better than the last one, you just plug in the camera, you don't buy the whole phone. Yeah, really good idea, of course. So brilliant, brilliant advice, thank you. We're getting, we're getting so many brilliant things in the chat box. Um, I think, so returning back to, you've just given some brilliant advice about um, what we should be thinking about um, and actually you know, seriously considering um, alternative models to capitalism, a lot of people are asking your advice about you know, what they can do in their own lives. So we have, for example, Sarah Allsop has asked, what is the number one thing we can do to make a difference? Um, Jasper Groom says, um, if each of us could do one thing to help the environment, what would it be? So what would your advice be to the listeners? And a lot of people have asked, have asked this. Okay. My this. advice is to, um, is to Buy a second-hand alarm clock. Recycle an alarm clock, because you don't want more new stuff. Recycle an alarm clock and um, set it 15 minutes earlier than the time that you would normally get up. 
And in that 15 minutes, determine that you're going to make a difference. It might be a small one. You might consider it to be an infinitesimally small one, but it might be significant. So in your 15 minutes, you know, uh, you know, 6.45 rather than seven o'clock, you could go onto social media and you could disseminate positive, optimistic information to people that otherwise wouldn't receive it. You could... Um, find a way of, of sharing your joy and your passion for the natural world. Or you could do something productive. I mean, I don't know how long, I'm not very good at, you know, woodwork. So it would take me a few mornings of my 15 minutes to make a bird box. But, you know, in that 15 minutes, you could do something practically and productive yourself. And I think that the key thing here is it's not the 15 minutes, it's the mental thing. And that is, it's self-empowerment. You've got to believe that you count and we all count. You know, and if you know that you're self-empowered, again, it is so mentally rewarding. You feel better. It's like people tell me they feel better when they've been to the gym and they do. I mean, I don't do any of that sort of stuff, but they tell me I'm, I'm missing out because their bodies feel better and therefore their minds feel better. But, you know, for me, you know, doing those little things, knowing that I'm empowered to make a difference, sometimes I fail. You know, it doesn't work, but occasionally it does then that just is just so uplifting. So self-empowerment is the key here. Know that you, you, all of us as individuals, and therefore collectively, have the power to affect positive change. It will make you feel good and it will make a difference. Secondhand alarm clock. That, that, that's great. That's, that's incredibly novel advice. Lots of people have been asking uh, what makes you feel optimistic. And I think you've sort of, covered that quite a lot as, you, as you've gone, gone along. I mean, Jen, Gemma McAllister, Janet Hoptroff, um, several other people. But I just wondered if um, uh, I could ask you this question and then we could return perhaps finally to your optimism. Um, we have a question that's really looking ahead, this one, um, from Holly Forster. And it's called Packham's Positive Predictions. Top three predictions for 2030. 2030, yeah. okay. I think that, okay, I'm gonna say I hope. I, I hope that by 2030, we will have reformed um, a lot of our energy uses in the, in the UK. Um, I, I'm hoping that, that, that all of our supermarkets will be filled full of electric car charging points for those people who don't have the opportunities to charge them at home. I'm hoping that there will be hardly any, uh, you know, internal combustion engine vehicles left on the road. Not that the electric cars are gonna save the world, but they are something which we, we need to move about. And they are something which when they become more affordable, then we can all embrace. So that sort of investment in infrastructure, uh, I think would be really good. I, I think that we have to, again, I hope that we invest in, you know, insulating our homes more effectively, that when we build new homes, we future-proof them, um, and that we, we pay for that little extra bit of insulation, which in Europe they have to. So in the UK, we insulate like this, in Europe, they insulate like that, but we stop skimping, uh, and we do that. And I hope that those homes are also ecologically friendly. They've got swift boxes in the roof. They cost nothing more to integrate the bat boxes and the swift box. And I think that every new home should be planted with a fruit tree if it has a garden and, and, and a pond. They should have a pond and a fruit tree, an apple tree. Um, and, and these are really simple things. And I, I think that, you know, those are the sorts of things that we, we, we need to see, see happening, to be quite honest with you. Equally, you know, if you give me a, if you were to give me a, a magic wand, I'm going to say fox hunting will finally have finished. We will no longer tolerate people killing animals simply for fun. Meat eating would have significantly reduced. People will spend more on their meat. It will be a luxury part of their diet. And therefore, they will be prepared to pay for animals that have had better standards of welfare and less a less damage, damaging ecological footprint. I, I see major changes in the way that we eat. Um, I, I think that comes through as, as well. And ultimately, I suppose what I would like to see is uh, 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 we're one species on one planet with one big problem and one chance to sort it out. We must work together. 
We've got to throw away the flags, forget the lines in the sand and realize that this is a tiny planet. And those burning houses in Australia or California, those floods in Indonesia are not far away. Those people are our neighbors at this point in time. And if we share what we have with our neighbors and vice versa, then collectively we can solve the problem. Look at what we've just done with COVID. In the space of a year, essentially, I mean, it's to say we've beaten the disease is not true. Obviously there are variants that always will be mutations, but we've got a vaccine. The human species is so ingenious, so imaginative, so resourceful and adaptable that when confronted with a problem, it always solves it. The trouble is, as I said to Brian this morning, you know, we're really good at cure, but we're not very good at prevention. We didn't need to have this pandemic. If we'd have listened to the epidemiologists, we wouldn't have had it. We would have had everything in place, ready to roll out straight away, but we didn't take their advice and look at what it's cost us. Let's start listening to scientific advice. Let's start investing in, in, in whatever it takes to not need pain before we get the bandages out. That's, that's wonderful. I think it's such a, a brilliant um, question, uh, sorry, answer to, to end on really, sort of, uh, so that, um, not just to listen to scientific advice, but I, you know, work together that to, to recognize that we're one part of a huge system and, uh, and to, to look, look ahead as well uh, and to be optimistic. So this, is, this I presume is what keeps you optimistic, Chris, that you really do think we can solve these problems. And uh, I know, I know we can solve the problems because I trust in science and I've seen in my lifetime, scientific techniques or, 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 or you know, evolve, come to the fore, be tried and tested and work. And we have an enormous portfolio of abilities and technologies to affect change. The problem, there's only one problem, and that is that we're not rolling them out broadly enough and rapidly enough. And one of the things that you're celebrating with Earth Optimism is all of those, are all of those successes. And, and they are individually enormously successful. I mean, in so, I don't know, sometimes I look at these, you look at the people that roll them out and, and the investment of their energies and their determination, and, and it's so inspirational. But the, the thing is that the reason we live in one of the most nature depleted countries in the world yet we are armed with this arsenal of, of abilities to rectify that is that we're only doing it in you know tiny places uh, and we're doing it really slowly and we're pontificating about it it's classic case is the beaver why on earth is it taking us so long to reintroduce this animal which is a, an ecosystem engineer which builds biodiversity why it's so embarrassing that it's taking us so long because we know it will work it's been, it's, it's worked everywhere else in the world that it's happened it, it's 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 again the, the the lack of you know beaver reintroduction and the badger cull and and all of these things will they'll be tattooed you know like Mary Scott, Queen of Scots, had Calais tattooed on her heart after she lost the, the you know, the fleet there. Well, when I go to my grave, badger cull and beaver reintroduction are going to be tattooed on my heart as things that I've failed to, 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 to motivate rapidly enough or to stop rapidly enough, you know. So, yes, of course, we have the answers. And yes, of course, we, we are optimistic, but we do need to get on with it. That's what we need to do. We need to use the power of that optimism of knowing that we can solve the problems to energize us to solve them now, more broadly, more rapidly and more effectively. That's brilliant, Chris. I think that is a fantastic note to end on. Um, so uh, and I think that's a great call, call to arms. I mean, we've got over a thousand people on this on this Zoom and I know a lot of people are going to be visiting our Earth Optimism uh, website. Um, in the next week. So I, I'd just like to close by, first of all, thanking all of you for joining us this evening. Everybody on Zoom, everybody watching us on YouTube. Um, it's been really fascinating uh, hearing about the breadth and depth of the questions you asked. And uh, I, I'm sorry we couldn't ask all of them, but uh, they were very, very much appreciated. Um, and I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking Chris so much for giving his time and for his really fantastic answers to your questions for sharing his ideas and um, basically inspiring us and not only giving us reasons for optimism, but giving us a call to arms that, um, you know, we, we really can do more. Um, 
Earth Optimism, as you know, is running all of this week, and there really are some remarkable real life conservation success stories. And what I love about them is that many, many of them are the stories that you never get to hear, hear about. You don't hear about them in the press. They're done by people from all walks of life. Um, there's, there's stories that are small, they're huge, um, but th that, that uh, we don't hear enough about them. And as Chris just said, you know, there are conservation success stories. And if we hear about them, find out what works, share it with others, then, then surely this change is gonna happen more quickly. Um, and as I said, we have a solutions fair, which has tons of useful, um, fun and surprising things you can do for nature in your home um, or office or when you're out and about. Uh, and that's running all week too. Um, the theme for tomorrow's Stories of Hope is choosing sustainability. So I think a lot of what uh, Chris said to us just now, a lot of your questions, I think is really relevant to that. So um, please do visit the Earth Optimism website uh, uh, for another session of inspiration and hope. And thank you again very much, Chris, and good night. <laughs>